It's the tournament no one wants to experience firsthand. Which country around the world created the worst punishment of all time? In the red corner, we've got Greece, putting on quite the show. Italy's going with an iconic horror from the past, but can anyone beat Scandinavia's Viking roots? And it looks like Russia's coming in with quantity, not quality. Who will win? We already know who the losers are, whoever is unfortunate enough to experience any of these punishments. Let's start in France, where they have one of the most iconic punishments of all time, the guillotine. Although it became one of the more popular ways to relieve someone of their head, in the Middle Ages, the headsman was the one who fulfilled the guillotine's job. This was a man hired especially to chop off the heads of convicts with maximum precision, which usually depended on how drunk the guy was that day. Those who showed up at an execution never knew what kind of show they were going to experience, fast and brutal, or slow and bloody. But it was getting harder to find qualified headsmen in the late 1700s, and then one man decided there must be a better way. Joseph Ignace Guillotin wanted to make sure the process of execution was as humane as possible. Instead, his name would forever be associated with horror. The guillotine was a simple device, a wooden stall that would hold the condemned in place with their head trapped in a narrow hole and a sharp blade overhead. When the cord was released, the blade would come rocketing down and neatly cleave off their head from their shoulders. No more worrying about drunken headsmen or dull axes. As long as the blade was polished regularly, the execution would be foolproof each time. Maybe a little too foolproof. It was designed for executing criminals, but then the French Revolution happened. Soon the king and queen found themselves under the guillotine, followed by anyone accused of counter-revolutionary activities. The executions became more and more common, and Mr. Guillotin could only watch as his humane execution device became a symbol of mass political murder. But at least it was quick, right? Maybe? Maybe not? While the device was designed to kill, immediately people have observed the eyes of the severed head staring intently in the moments after the execution. Some have even reported them reacting to stimuli. While it's impossible to survive an execution by guillotine because the head is disconnected from all vital organs, no one knows exactly how long it takes for the victim to expire. That uncertainty is what made the guillotine France's most horrific punishment. Well, that and the fact that it turned making heads roll into an industrial process that could be done dozens of times a day. Now let's head over the border to Spain, where they're taking it much slower. If you were told you were about to face the Spanish donkey, you might not be too scared. What's the worst that can happen? Some ornery beast tries to kick or bite you when you're trying to clean out its stables? Nope, this isn't some everyday burrow. It's an ingeniously simple torture device created by the sadistic forces of the Spanish Inquisition to take their captives and force them to share information, or just confess to whatever crime they needed to justify their execution. And it looked not too much different from your average hobby horse, if hobby horses were designed by someone with no regard for human anatomy. It was one of the easiest forms of torture for the Inquisition to use. You just place the prisoner on the horse, with their hands tied behind their backs, and then leave them there. We've all had some very uncomfortable seats over the years, and there are ways to deal with it. Maybe you shift your position, even stand up briefly, or sit on your hands to relieve the pressure. None of those are an option for a victim of the Spanish donkey, where the sharp triangular point is sticking up directly where the sun don't shine. While this would be deeply uncomfortable for anyone sitting on it, most of the victims were men, and there it could do some permanent damage. Many of those who were forced to sit on the donkey at length suffered from impotence and incontinence as a result of the damage to their genitals, plus permanent issues with walking due to how it affected their hips. It was highly effective, and it stuck around. While the Spanish version was the most common and often the most painful, it became an effective form of ad hoc punishment and torture around the world. It even made its way over to the United States, where it was used to punish Confederate prisoners during the Civil War, and later as a method of abuse in the South against former slaves. A variation called Riding the Rail had prisoners straddling a fence as they were paraded around town to jeers and assaults. While almost everyone survived this form of torture, unlike Madame Guillotine, most who were subjected to it suffered some form of permanent damage, giving Spain a memorable entry into the worst punishment sweepstakes for sheer spread alone. But for sheer scope, no one tops Europe's neighbor to the east. Most of these torture methods were centuries ago and have long since fallen out of favor. But today, there are still countless people with roots in Russia or the former Soviet states who feel a chill when they hear the word gulag. As soon as the Soviet government took power under Vladimir Lenin, they wanted to create a new system of punishment for crime. The gulags were an elaborate network of labor camps around the massive territory of the Soviet Union, and they were set up to punish those convicted of anything from petty crime to disloyalty to Soviet ideals. 
Ostensibly, the goal of the camps was rehabilitation through labor, with the prisoners producing goods that would be used for the greater good and eventually be released to become productive Soviet citizens. But intentions do not always turn into fact. Under Lenin, the gulags were a relatively limited system. Under his successor, Joseph Stalin, they exploded, and soon all of the Russian countryside was dotted with them. Many were located in the brutal frozen region of Siberia. Those sent there were often members of whole villages or entire classes of farmers, who were deemed enemies of the state. By the end of 1940, the population of the gulags had topped 1.5 million, and it's believed that up to 14 million people passed through this brutal system over its lifespan until it was largely abolished by Stalin's successor. But while many live to tell the tale, it's estimated that a full 10% or more of gulag residents ultimately died, and that statistic may be much worse than it sounds. The gulags were not designed to be execution methods, unlike the brutal Nazi death camps where people were worked until they could no longer be useful and then eliminated. But the combination of malnutrition, brutal climate in Siberia, abusive guards, and a lack of oversight from Moscow meant conditions were often horrific. When people were no longer able to work due to being seriously ill, they were often released, and then soon after they died. Their deaths no longer classified as being due to the gulag. It was not until the end of the Soviet era that the full extent of the system was revealed, and many of the survivors have told harrowing tales of just how hard it was to survive. But many of the others were likely too scared to do anything but keep their heads down and avoid another encounter with the Gulag. Now let's head out of Europe and way south to the most modern punishment on this list. South Africa was a brutal place in the 1980s and that led to brutal resistance. The apartheid government cruelly suppressed the majority black population and leaders like Nelson Mandela were imprisoned for life. Others weren't so lucky. Protesters could be brutally beaten by police and anti-apartheid leaders like Stephen Biko were murdered. The rebel movement had largely become convinced that the only thing left to do was fight back by any means necessary, but not everyone in the community agreed. Some were too scared to resist, others would even collaborate with local white authorities, and extreme figures within the movement were determined to make an example of them. It was 1985 when the first reported example of necklacing took place, a brutal form of vigilante justice against accused collaborators. A young woman named Maki Skosana was attending a funeral when she was kidnapped. Her attackers took a rubber tire, placed it around her neck, and soaked it in petrol. The tire was then lit on fire, and she was slowly burned to death in a disturbing modern-day version of the classic execution method of burning at the stake. Her crime? She was accused of being an informant. But there's no proof that she ever actually was, and she was attending the funeral of four youth activists who had been killed by the government. And as an ad hoc vigilante execution, the horrors vary. Some victims of necklacing had their hands tied behind their backs to prevent them from taking the tire off, while others reportedly had tendons in their arms cut. Some cases saw the victim brutally beaten before their necklacing, while others had them killed quickly by having a rock dropped on them in the middle of the burning. Unlike the others on the list, this wasn't a government punishment, which meant it could be whatever the mob wanted. And while the number of necklacings was dwarfed by the countless executions and murders by the apartheid government, the brutality of this punishment meant it was widely feared throughout the era until the apartheid government fell. Heading to Asia, few execution methods were a better show than this one, but not for the person at the center of it. Is there any more impressive beast out there than the elephant? The largest land mammal alive today, these tusked beasts are marvelous from a distance and can be terrifying up close if you're a poacher or an abusive circus tamer. While they're not aggressive by nature, the large herbivores can attack viciously and surprisingly fast if they feel they or their children are being threatened. Still, in India in particular, the elephant has been an important part of their society and can be trained and are very useful beasts of burden that can carry massive loads with relative ease, if treated well and their potentially deadly nature was only positive for some cruel rulers. If an elephant actually wants to kill you, you're probably not getting out alive. And your odds go down even more if you're restrained with an entire court of onlookers cheering on the elephant. That was the brutal reality of death by trampling. Starting in 200 BCE, the rulers of India would commonly use elephants to execute criminals for crimes as small as stealing property. This was also used to execute prisoners of war, and it would usually be a large show with countless people turning out to see the elephants do their work. While it might seem like a brutal reality of ancient times, it continued for well over a thousand years and was witnessed by Alexander Hamilton himself. And in this one, both the executioner and the elephant often had their say. How horrific was execution by elephant? Well, that depends on the day and the mood. 
If the elephant was carrying out a lot of executions that day, odds are the executioner would just want them to go down the line. The most efficient way to kill someone using this method is stepping on their heads, in which case it probably looked a little something like when you stepped on an old Halloween pumpkin as a kid. Anyone in the splatter zone, don your ponchos now. But if it was a particularly loathed prisoner, like would be a political assassin, or if the ruler just had a sick sense of humor, the elephant could be guided to do it slowly, crushing one limb at a time before eventually doing the victim in by pressure on their chest. It could even be survivable, leaving a horribly maimed prisoner with crushed limbs. But did anyone ask the elephants how they felt about it? They remember everything, after all. This method of execution was largely done away with in India when they were colonized by the British, but the British were no slouches in the Department of Horrible Punishments. Ah, jolly old England, home to charming accents, fine tea, and public displays of horror. In the Middle Ages, you might be walking the streets and finding a cage hanging, and inside the body of a criminal. This was known as the gibbet, a way to shame the worst criminals out there by taking their body after execution and putting them on display in the public square. It was hoped that this would deter future criminals, especially those from similar gangs. This was why this was a common way of dealing with the bodies of pirates or traitors, if not an especially sanitary one. But what's the big deal? It's not like the dead care what's done with them, right? Well, not everyone who was subjected to the gibbet was dead yet. Also known as hanging in chains, this was often used as one of the most prolonged forms of execution. The convict would be placed in the gibbet that would be their tomb often in very tight quarters that kept them from moving or making much of a scene. They would then be hung from the gallows-like structure as people came and mocked the doomed individual. This would occasionally be used as a way to lead up to the execution, putting the condemned on display for public shaming and humiliation. But just as often, they would simply be left there in the blazing sun or freezing cold until thirst or exposure won out. And you'd better hope that you are not downwind. Once the criminal was dead, their punishment was over, but it was pretty common for the body to be left up there in the gibbet for a long time, no matter how ripe it got. This was common for monarchs to place enemies of the crown on display as a way to warn people not to cross them, but it often backfired. If you had to walk by the body of your executed leader every day, would you be more or less likely to continue rebelling against the crown? But that didn't make it any less common. As of the Murder Act of 1751, Gibbeting became standard issue in England, no matter how many people were disgusted. But it wasn't the most infamous way to put the condemned on display. Let's head south to Italy, where back in Roman times they created one of the cruelest execution methods of all time, and certainly the only one millions of people are exposed to in church daily. Everyone knows the most famous person who was crucified, but how many people were subject to this horrible punishment overall? Would you believe it was a form of mass execution? The Roman general Varus alone crucified 2,000 Jewish people right before the calendar switched from BCE to CE, and it's believed to have been a mass form of execution during the next few centuries. And for those who experienced it, it was a question of what you got first. Crucifixion is deceptively simple, and it doesn't actually seem to put the victims to death, yet they die very soon all the same. A more violent version of gibbeting or the stocks, it takes the condemned and nails them to a large T-shaped piece of wood their feet to the lower part and their hands spread out on each end of the tee. The cross is then erected and the victim is left to bake in the hot sun. But they most likely won't be around to die of exposure. This method manages to kill its victims much sooner than expected. For one thing, the blood loss and infection from the wounds will do a lot of damage. But the true killer is usually the posture, with the person's arms spread out and even the slightest movement causing agonizing pain. The act of taking a breath is nearly impossible. The intense pressure on the lungs means the victim will asphyxiate before long. And for those who experience it, that would be a relief. Crucifixion is a long process, with the mounting of the cross being the final part. First, the condemned is usually forced to bear the cross on their back and carry it to the field where they'll be mounted, often being brutally whipped along the way by the Roman guards. By the time they've arrived at the execution field, they've already been beaten bloody, which will speed up the eventual death. It's a brutally effective system, one that's almost foolproof, horribly painful, and serves as a warning to anyone else who might want to commit a grave crime against the Roman state. You know, things like being a petty thief or believing a different religion. Crucifixion mostly died out with the end of the Roman Empire, but a brutal method like this will always find admirers. There are even isolated examples of it being used as late as World War II by Soviet forces. Let's stick with the Mediterranean as we look at one of the most infamous punishments of all time, straight from Greece. Say you're a particularly sadistic tyrant king, and you'd love nothing more than executing your enemies. But after a while, it starts to get a little old hat. 
You've done beheadings, you've done hangings, you've done throwing them off a cliff. Sure, every victim is a little different, but where's the flair? That was part of the problem facing Phalaris, the tyrant king of Akragas. The island in what is now Sicily was part of the Greek Empire, and the cruel leader was known for his brutality. But one inventor named Perilaus wanted to impress the king, so he worked tirelessly to create a new execution method that would amuse this all-powerful madman. It might have worked a little too well. Meet the brazen bull. No, it's not a labyrinth with a killer bull man inside, although we're sure Phalaris would have loved to have one of those. It's the convergence of style and function, a new way of burning people alive in a giant bronze sculpture of a bull. The bull has a door in one side in which the condemned is shoved, at which point a fire is lit under the bull and the condemned is locked inside and burned alive. But that is not the unique part. Like a deranged version of a childhood speak and spell, it had acoustic apparatus that changed the screams of the condemned into a lower sound resembling the mooing of a bull. The cow says, Oh God, get me out of here! Paralaus knew his target audience a little too well. The Mad King wanted to see it tested immediately, so he ordered the inventor shoved inside as the first victim. But what goes around comes around and reportedly the device was used to execute Phalaris as he was overthrown. The device was only used briefly and has long since been lost to history, but some historians have claimed it may have just been propaganda by his successors to make him look like a madman. There's just one problem with that. There are a lot of reports of it being used, including later tales of both the Romans and the Visigoths building their own to terrorize their enemies. So if the brazen bull wasn't created by Phalaris, the Greek storytellers who created it may have accidentally brought it to life. Now let's head over to the Far East where they have their own flair for cruel punishments. Many of the most famous execution methods are either fast and brutal like the guillotine or hanging, or largely kill someone through letting nature do its work, like crucifixion. But in China, the practitioners of Ling Chi believed that doing something right was worth putting in the effort. One of the most prolonged and extended methods of execution, it's been given the nickname the death of a thousand cuts, and usually only requires a pole, a rope, a knife, and an executioner who doesn't mind taking as long as needed to deal out some pain. And there was more than one layer to this torture. The actual method was simple enough. The condemned would be tied to a wooden frame, usually in public, and their flesh would then be carefully sliced away from their body. It's similar to the ancient punishment of flaying or skinning, but much slower and with less likelihood of going into shock and dying quickly. It could be used as a method of interrogation, a public torture of an outsider seen as an enemy, or as an execution method for a particularly cruel criminal such as a murderer. But there was another element to this punishment that might have been even worse. Ling Chi wasn't just seen as torture for the body but for the soul. According to the principles of Confucius, altering or cutting of the body was considered an affront against filial piety and would keep the spirit from being intact after death. So with every cut, the condemned knew their afterlife was being destroyed as well. The torture would continue until the executioner decided they'd had enough, at which point they would receive one final cut to the throat, which at that point usually came as a relief. Now it's just a quick jump across the pond to Japan, where they had a very different method of punishing the condemned. Capital punishment in the Edo period in Japan was common and brutal, but they didn't really have their own distinct horrible punishment. The condemned could face decapitation, hanging, burning at the stake, being boiled alive, or even crucifixion for the worst crimes like murder of a parent, a veritable greatest hits of torture. Those executed would also face public humiliation before and display of their body after. But for those who wanted to avoid this horrible fate, there was another option, although not an appealing one. They were offered a death with honor, but it came at a horrible cost. Being a samurai came with a privilege, the privilege of being able to avoid capital punishment by taking matters into your own hand. A disgraced samurai was still considered a nobleman, and if he committed a crime harsh enough to warrant the death penalty, he would be given the option of seppuku. This meant that they gave their sword one final victim, themselves. This was seen as a death with honor, but it wasn't exactly voluntary. They would often be ordered to do this in lieu of being given a commoner's execution. And there was a specific ritual for this ugly affair. If the samurai was found guilty of a capital crime, they would be given a sentence of death and a deadline to commit seppuku. If they refused or tried to escape, another samurai would be given the job of carrying it out and usually decapitate the samurai. Unlike the traditional seppuku, this did not carry the benefit of absolving the samurai of his sins, which meant that his family would likely be stripped of their ranks and perks as a result. So for the disgraced samurai, the call of the sword was feared, but usually followed. 
Now let's head to the Great White North for a punishment so cruel it became the stuff of legends. The Vikings were feared warriors. Depending on who you ask, they were either fierce defenders of their territory or sadistic marauders. The answer probably depends on which Viking you meet. But there's no question that if you cross the wrong one, you were probably in for a very bad time. They frequently killed people in duels, beheaded their enemies, and burned entire villages to the ground. But did they have a particular punishment that might have eclipsed all the others in sheer torture? If you look at the ancient Icelandic texts known as sagas, the answer is yes. Get ready to meet the Blood Eagle. Appearing twice in Norse literature, it seems to be a more unique torture method for enemies rather than an actual common execution method, and that's probably a good thing because it wasn't easy to pull off. The victim would be placed in a prone position, and the torturer would use a knife to sever their ribs from their spine. They would then pull their lungs out through the opening, creating a pair of wings that would move as the victim breathed and they inflated and deflated. It was horrific, so horrific that some wonder if it ever actually happened. It appears several times in the texts, usually done to the family members of deposed royals. Some historians proposed it could have been a form of human sacrifice to Odin, while others said it was too outlandish. It was questioned whether it was survivable, and the answer seems to be yes, if not for very long at all. Was it a Christian myth aimed at making the ancient Norse look like barbarians, or a real execution method practiced by particularly sadistic rulers? The texts point to the latter, but there's no one around to ask, and we're pretty glad about that. These probably don't match up, thankfully, but why not watch Worst Punishments Kids Received From Their Parents next? Or check out 10 Most Brutal Punishments Prison Guards Have Given To Prisoners For How Bad Things Can Get In The Big House.